at Deep Future Analytics. Today's webinar is jointly sponsored by On Approach and Deep Future Analytics. On Approach is a CUSO and a leading provider of reporting and analytics solutions to credit unions. Deep Future Analytics is also a CUSO and it's organized to bring Dr. Breeden's innovative credit risk model to credit unions. First, a few housekeeping items. Please use the chat feature if you have technical difficulties and Austin or Lori from On Approach will assist you. If you have questions for Joe, please use the chat feature and I will ask the questions either at the end of the presentation or during the presentation if appropriate. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Joe Breeden. Dr. Breeden has almost 20 years of experience in financial services. He's created risk models through the 1995 Mexican peso crisis the 1997 Asian economic crisis, the 2001 global recession, the 2003 Hong Kong SARS recession, and the 2007-9 U.S. mortgage crisis. These crises have provided Dr. Breeden with a rare perspective on crisis management and the analytics needs of executives for strategic decision making. His book, entitled Reinventing Retail Analytics, Forecasting, Stress Testing, Capital, and Scoring for a World of Crises was first published by Risk Books in 2010 and is now in its second edition. He currently serves as Associate Editor of the Journal of Risk Model Validation. I'd like to thank each of you for attending today's webinar and now turn the presentation over to Joe. Thank you, Dale. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. We're going to uh, go through today and probably not take the entire time. Uh, if uh, some of you need to leave early, we'll make sure that we get right to the point. But uh, today we want to focus on, uh, as Dale said, how to grow the portfolio and increase net margin. And really this comes down to pricing. How do we set pricing on new loans and how do we do this in a, uh, a thoughtful and, and quantitative way? Um, we asked this question when you uh, signed up for the webinar, how do you set your pricing? Do you meet the market? Basically, you want to stay in the game, keep a certain market share so you match uh, the, uh, what the competitive pricing is. Are you judgment-based? And obviously, all pricing is some combination of the first two. Uh, so there's a choice here of whether you consider yourself more meeting the market or more judgmental. The third one is model-based. And of course, there's a wide range of uh, what constitutes models. Um, the uh, chart here shows the survey summary. And you can see that uh, if I put together meet the market and judgment, given uh, how similar they are, um, that would be equivalent to the no response. So, uh, you know, that's, that's clearly a large group. What we want to do is we'll talk a little bit about the obvious problems that come when you're in a meet the market mode. Uh, I don't think it'll be a surprise, but hopefully some concrete examples will be informative. And then we want to talk about what it takes to be model-based. And honestly, we don't expect anybody in one fell swoop, as they say, to go from no analytics to a complete uh, full-featured pricing model. But if you start building out the pieces of a pricing model and using those in your judgment, you can get yourself that direction. So let's uh, head on here. Given that uh, we're all busy and some of you may want to know what the point of this is before getting too far in, I'll tell you right now. Um, the message here is that you can't find market opportunities by following the market. It's difficult when you're talking about pricing. People often say, well, if I don't meet the market, I'll be out of the market. Uh, I, I won't be able to originate mortgages if I can't match market pricing. We're not going to take such a draconian approach. We're going to say, let's look for pockets of opportunities. Let's look for areas where the market may be mispriced um, because we understand the competitive pressures. And Joe, we, uh, yes. Joe, this is Lori, and I'm not seeing your screen. That's interesting. Um, I'm getting lots of people telling, now we can see it. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yep, I reset. Um, 
Fortunately, I didn't show any visual content that mattered. <laughs> Sorry about that. Here's the graph uh, of what people thought. So I'll give you a moment to see that. Uh, basically, meet the market, judgment, model-based, etc. Uh, so model-based is not the dominant answer, was the point of this. But it is clearly where a lot of people have interest. So we want to talk about that. And the, the takeaway message here being, um, you can't find market opportunities by following the market, as I said. Um, but if you also, if you purely follow the market, you can get killed. Is a simple story. I'll talk more about this in the context of mortgage, but we saw this a lot. Much of what happened in the mortgage crisis was following the market uh, when the best advice would have been to step out. So the final message not to rely on market pricing to run your business for you. So let's talk about how to help that. Growth, pricing, risk management, these are all very connected. Controlling growth comes from controlling pricing. And pricing must consider risk and return, of course. Um, the, uh, as in preparing these slides, um, I was reminded of a quote which was, uh, you can tell my age, because this is from the uh, old TV show called uh, The Six Million Dollar Man. We can rebuild it. We have the technology. We can make it better than it was, better, faster, safer. Uh, this is actually true. There's nothing I'm going to talk about that requires brand new innovation. All these techniques are known. It's just a matter of pulling together the right techniques and the right data and taking the time to build out the model. So let's start with an example. This is just a small piece of a pricing sheet. Um, it's auto lending. And what you can see here is different score bands, uh, different tiers. You can see on the uh, rows are different LTV levels. This little piece of the table is for 48-month auto loans. And in here is, is the various pricing. Now this is essentially a meet the market pricing sheet with a little bit of judgmental on top of this, uh, which is a typical thing to do. Um, as you can see by looking across this, pricing always follows risk. That as you go to the lower scores, as you go to the higher LTV, uh, the pricing goes up. And in fact in this pricing matrix there are the little tildes for the cells that are prohibited. Uh, the assumption was too much risk to be considered, we won't go there. So that's fine. It, it, when you look at this, this is sensible. Um, I think few players in the market are doing completely uh, uh, senseless things because you don't stay in business very long that way. But really, quantitatively, is this right? Have we really priced appropriately for increased risk? Or going the other direction, have we priced appropriately for the lowest risk? So. You know, are these prices really capturing the uh, increase in loss risk, the attrition risk, or the economy? So that's what we want to dig into. How do we know that? How do we figure that out? Uh, Dale uh, gave a kind introduction of myself, and, and he gave the list of crises uh, that I've lived through from a banking context. Many of us have. And the first thing you have to admit is that really all banking crises are pricing failures because it, it's a cheap statement but on the one hand if you price correctly you can avoid any crisis. Uh, crises come from when the pricing is mismatched to the environment, the economic environment, the credit cycle that you're living through. So when we look at the things that cause bank failures honestly the thing that is most likely to bring down a lender so I'm using this bank term generically, but the pricing model is the thing most likely to break the bank, uh, especially if that's a meet the market price. Um, so you know any approach can be done badly. I don't want to just beat up on meeting the market. A model can also be bad, uh, but pricing is important. And this uh, this next bullet is really personal experience. I was building models for mortgage lenders in the U.S. Uh, back in 2004, 2005, and when we made loss forecasting models, we would always start with, what's your scenario? 
What are you going to do next year? Because we need to know that to predict your losses. Without fail, the mortgage lenders were saying, we want to grow the portfolio 40% year over year, but don't drop the FICO score. Don't drop the cutoff score. Well, that sounds aggressive on the one hand. They said we want to grow 40% because they had been growing 40% year over year the previous two years. They were trying to be conscientious on risk management by saying don't drop the FICO score. But the unintended consequence here was rather severe. Um, the hardworking teams, given these objectives, in fact, did go out and meet those growth targets in 04, 05. Many of them went right on in 06. Um, they did it without dropping the FICO score. If you look at these portfolios and the industry, FICO tracking was constant. But two to three years later, these same portfolios collapsed from bad loans. <clears throat> Why is that? Well, it's a couple of things. One is that FICO score is not everything there is to know about risk. It, it can't be. For one thing, any bureau score is based on what the consumer has done in the past. What loans did they have in the past? How did they perform in the past? Based on that, you're going to give them a new loan, which fundamentally changes their behavior. The act of lending changes the credit risk profile of the people you're lending to. The moment you give them a new loan, their real risk is no longer what their score said it was. Um, so that's the first point. The other point was that even knowing that, they hadn't priced for risk. What they were doing in order to grow 40% without dropping the cutoff score, the FICO score, was to do lots of things that the score couldn't see. So they were going alternate channels, they were using alternate products, they were doing many things that the underwriting criteria weren't picking up on. So what looked like sound judgment, let's grow but let's keep our score constant, uh, wound up being an open door for the sales and marketing teams to defeat the scoring and underwriting process. We can't be univariate. We can't just look at one metric like score. We've got to take into account the whole spectrum and really talk about risk not just that one thing. So um, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York actually studied this. Uh, I made my previous comment based on experience inside the lenders, but uh, they did an industry-wide study and saw what we expect to see, that the scores tracked steadily across all lending when you looked through the crisis. What you don't see in the score tracking is a recession. And it's because the score is not designed for that. Scores don't predict probability. They just rank order. They're designed to tell you whether you or your neighbor is the higher risk. And then it's up to the lender to decide whether to give a loan to one of you or both of you or neither of you. So when it comes to pricing, score tells you which one is the bigger risk, but it doesn't tell you what price to set for those loans. So what we want to do is find a better way. And another part of that mortgage crisis that I mentioned, um, another personal story, I was working creating a forecast model for a large lender, large US lender. And at the beginning of 2006, we got our first data set, data through the end of 2005 for a mortgage lender. We loaded it up, we started making our models, we had very good vintage level um, age period cohort models, those terms may not mean anything now, we'll come back to that, but these were very accurate models for what we were trying to do, just forecast losses. Um, what we saw was that they were growing volume dramatically, they were growing it in the riskier segments dramatically, and the credit risk on the loans coming in were, was significantly worse than normal even given their score segmentation. So all the stuff I just said, we picked up on at the end of 2005, the beginning of 2006. So our forecast said in two years they were going to have 10 times the losses. But I looked at this and said, well, it's obvious what you're doing, and it's obvious you intentionally booked all these loans. So it was no accident they booked a lot of loans in their higher risk segments. So I wasn't worried about the fact they're going to have higher losses, because if you've priced for what you've booked, you'll be fine. If you're booking more loans in the riskier segments, one assumes you're pricing for riskier loans. Well, when we gave this forecast, 
the analyst on the other end of the call went quiet for, you know, it felt like minutes. It was probably 30 seconds, but it was an eternity. And he finally said, if this is true, we're out of business. I didn't understand why. I still naively assumed they had priced for the losses because losses don't put you out of business. Failure to price does. In fact, they did go out of business because they had priced based on a moving average of the previous couple of years losses. But those were different loans and it was a different economy. They hadn't priced on what the economy might do going forward because things were changing fast. They didn't price for the volume, the timing, the credit risk profile, any of that. They were just pricing on what were my losses the last two years and what is the market price. This was a very large lender, one of the biggest mortgage lenders in the U.S. You would think they had better models than that. Well, they didn't. Um, you don't need to be huge and you don't need huge amounts of data to make a better model than that. So. Um, that's why I'm so passionate about this stuff, because I've seen these portfolios fail from the inside, and it doesn't have to be that way. So let's talk about how, how to not fail. That's, that's pretty much my career, is how to not fail. That's what we're in business for, right? Um, to move to quantitative pricing, we, the best practice is really to estimate future margin quantitatively and over the life of the loan. So if I set this price, what will I get as a return? Somebody has an estimate of that. It, it's not like nobody's ever done this. In every organization, someone has a model, usually a spreadsheet, that says, with this pricing, here's my estimate on our margin. Now, varying degrees of sophistication. Um, in an ideal world, these are the key things we want to talk about. How does margin uh, change? How does, it, how does the calculation of that depend on a certain list of things? And this list, it says, how will these evolve? The point is that through the life of a loan, the things on this list are not static. We need to consider how balances grow or pay down, depending on the loan type, versus the age of the loan. We have to consider attrition probability, prepayment risk. If the loan's not there, you don't collect interest. We have to look at the loss timing. Loss timing is a big issue that has caused multiple portfolio failures over the last 20 years that I've seen. That you book a lot of loans today, you think you're doing great for two years, but the peak in losses for those new originations may be two or three years from now, as they were in the mortgage crisis. So you can think you're doing great things for a couple of years before all the losses come in and you start to realize. From a pricing perspective, that means you don't price based on whether you're seeing good performance from recent loans. You really have to project when will I see a lot of loss and how much will there be. That's the loss timing. Of course we need credit risk. And with credit unions in particular, you've got more of a relationship than most lenders. So there's more of an opportunity. I'll show you some things that we found in looking at credit risk that are, are interesting and unique. We have the future economic environment. Th this is the hardest thing to put into a pricing model. What will the future economy be? It's really what nobody wants to put in their pricing models. But we'll talk about ways to do that, ways to make that sensible. Because honestly, nobody wants to get a scenario from an economist and base your pricing on the economist. We just don't trust those guys that much. But we do need their advice. So a little bit of compromise is required. Recoveries, of course, if there's collateral, or even if there's not, but the, the nature of recovery changes based on the age of the loan, uh, the assets, etc. The last item on here, expenses. So we're going to go through and talk about these. Um, this is not going to be an analytics training course, but just conceptually, what do we need to do here? So I mentioned for balance growth or pay down, the key point, as we all know, is that these things change with time, so we need a model of this. Um, we need a model that says, uh, what is the pattern of uh, pay down of principal for installment loans or growth of balance for lines of credit? With installment loans, it's pretty obvious because you've got uh, a payment schedule for auto and mortgage. There's not too much surprise there. Lines of credit are more of a challenge. 
what is the balance growth pattern for a credit card, for you know any other line of credit? How does that depend on the uh, uh, the uh, credit line that you've assigned that you've offered? Because up to a certain credit line, people will utilize all you give them. Beyond a certain point, they won't. So there is some interesting modeling to be done, especially around lines of credit. Um, but it's not complicated modeling. This is pretty simple stuff, just figuring out the, the pattern of balance growth. In general, balance growth is not very sensitive to the economy. It's mostly a life cycle effect. What about attrition? Attrition is a good one because I've seen a lot of pricing models based on just an assumption that auto loans last so long or mortgages last five years, whatever it is. Of course, these things have terms assigned. And the graph here is showing a survival pro uh, proportion. Of the loans I booked day one, so that's my 100% point at the top left, what percentage of those loans remain as you go through time? Now, this is based on a, a real data study, and these things fall off very quickly. The black curve here is for 48-month uh, loans, four-year loans. You can see it's pretty much down to zero, uh, just a bit beyond 48. But the halfway point is about 22. That a 48-month loan, half these loans are gone in 22 months. So that's shorter, honestly, that's shorter than I would have expected before looking at the data. It says that we've really got to take that into account in our pricing, that if these are not going to be around very long, we may not make the money we thought we would. And you can see there's quite a difference between that and the six- or seven-year loans where the uh, half-life is more out to uh, 40 months. So segmentation, of course, is the point here, that we need to segment by different product categories to see what this pattern is, see what it looks like for uh, lines of credit products as well. Every product has an attrition pattern. What's interesting with lines of credit is, of course, you'll see big blips around uh, annual fees of any sort, that sort of thing. Loss timing I mentioned earlier, and of course loss timing depends very much on the product. Here again we're working from real data. Uh, a little bit of noise and wiggle on these curves, but they capture the idea that some of these curves, the peaks come earlier, some come later. Uh, it would have been interesting to overlay a mortgage curve on here. We didn't have mortgage data for this study. It would have peaked somewhere around three or four years, two, three, four. Mortgages a long time. You can see many of these auto products have a peak around two years, three years, and then a, uh, a rise at the end of term. So this, these curves are measuring for me the monthly probability of charging off for whatever pool of loans still exists. So if I book a thousand loans in uh, day one, three years later I may be down to half of those 500. So of those 500, what's the probability of a charge off? That's what these curves tell me. So when I'm doing my pricing, again, I want to know the timing. I want to know how long are they likely to be with me before they charge off? Because honestly, this curve that says other excluding vehicles, so these are just a, a category of assorted loans but not vehicle, um, it peaks rather quickly. It, these loans don't last very long, which means I don't have long to create, you know, to generate revenue from interest payments and such. Conversely, the one that says other vehicle, RVs and mobile homes and such, those are lasting a lot longer. They, they're not peaking immediately, um, which tells me that even though they may they charge, charge off, off, they won't charge off immediately. So let's say I have two products and the total lifetime charge off probability is 1%. But for one of them, the peak is in the first year and for the other, the peak is in the fourth year. That 1% is totally different. One of those I make a lot of money from because they're going to hang around for a while and make payments. The other, they're not. So knowing when the, the charge-offs will come is critical for knowing if I'm going to make money. Credit risk is the one that's most obvious. I think this is where we have the most intuitive connection. Everyone knows that credit risk depends on things like product. Obviously, I mentioned FICO and LTV are inputs. But it depends on what product you offer. 
I've heard people say there are no bad products. And to a certain extent, that's true. If you looked at uh, option arms, the mortgages where you could decide how much you were going to pay, if you're offering that to a very prime customer with lots of assets and he's doing financial management on how much to pay in a certain month on his mortgage versus something else, that's one thing. If you take that same product and offer it to a pr subprime consumer with no assets other than what they're about to buy and make it an option arm, that's not the same consumer. That's not going to be the same relationship. So that option arm product, of course, had huge losses when it was run as a subprime offering. So product matters, simple answer. We all know that channel matters. Direct is always lower losses than indirect. Uh, plenty of reasons for that, but we just go through and quantify it in the modeling. Let's make sure we have that adjustment. Collateral matters, of course. Um, and I have on here the, the credit union relationship. There are a number of ways to look at this. A simple one is just how much does that uh, member have in any form of deposit or investment with your institution. When we add up all of those deposits, simple relationship, the more deposit, the lower the losses. And it's rather dramatic. As soon as you get into the uh, a few thousand dollars, the charge-off rate is dramatically lower. So it's just telling me that relationship really does matter. And the last one on here, adverse selection. This, honestly, this is the subject of a webinar and several research papers in itself. What we're learning from studying the last mortgage crisis is that the economic conditions at the time the loan was offered matter. That basically you get adverse selection because the consumers who are taking loans may not be the same consumers you're used to giving loans to. If the economy is struggling, you have to ask, why do you want to loan now? It's one of those old questions we never used to ask. We used to ask all the time and now it seems we don't because we rely on the FICO score. But what we have found is that if you're looking at mortgage, if house prices are falling or if they're rising too fast, if you're in a hyperinflated market where they're going up 10, 20 percent year over year, conservative consumers are scared. They don't want to buy in a falling market or a market that looks like a bubble. So the ones left asking for a loan to buy in those conditions are not the same people you're used to. Same with interest rates. If interest rates are rising, that's not a buying opportunity. If interest rates are falling, your value shopper, your conservative, conscientious uh, member looks at that and says, now's a good time to buy a home. I think I'll get that mortgage. Or now's a good time to buy a car. So there is consumer risk appetite that strongly affects things. You need to look. This is a judgmental aspect. There's analytics we can do. But at the very least, judgmentally, be looking at the market and ask yourself, would I want a mortgage now or would I want an auto loan now? And if the answer is no, you need to re-examine your pricing because you want to know who is actually taking up those loans. Okay. The environment, I said, is, is the tricky part. Of course, you don't want to price for past environment. That was part of the mortgage problem. 03, 04 were great economies, um, great in the sense of low unemployment, rising house prices. You don't want to price for that if you're sitting in 2005. Ironically, you also don't want to price for the current environment. You really want to look forward and say, where will things go from here? And as we sit here today, if I'm offering a mortgage loan or a seven-year auto loan, I'm going to have that for a while. You know, even with the attrition rates, even if it's going to wind up being a three- or four-year loan, I'm still going to have that for a while. So where are things going to go from here? Do I think they're going to get better? Do I think they're going to get worse? The real answer is why not try a few alternatives? But on this graph, we're showing an, an economic index, how the economy has impacted a loan portfolio. And the higher numbers on here is higher losses from the economy. The lower negative numbers is, is lower than average losses. And so at the point when we were running this analysis, this fed into a pricing model. We said, we're sitting a little bit better than average for how this portfolio has been impacted by the economy in the past. So if we're already a little bit better than average, how should I price? 
Well, what we did, the technical detail here is we made a mean reverting model that said, let's assume this gradually relaxes onto the average. So out in years four, five, six, out to 30 for a mortgage, I'm going to price that part based on an average economy. In other words, I'm going to estimate my losses for those years based on an average economy. But in the next few years, if we're sitting better than average right now, I could conservatively say, let's assume things get a little worse. Or I could be a little less conservative and say, hey, my economist is absolutely certain that things are going to get better. I believe him for about six months. So I'll build in improvement for six months and then a gradual relaxation onto what is the long run average. It turns out that last process I just described is exactly what's in the CECL guidelines for ALLL. If they really do what they wrote down, if FASB goes along with the, what they've proposed, then all of us will be building forecasting, lifetime loss forecast models with a scenario like I just described starting in 2015 or 2016. Of course, there'll be rollout time. So this kind of thing is coming. Why not use it now for pricing? Um, so that we're, I mean, that's where it matters. And then expenses. With expenses, you can get carried away with this. And when we talk about pricing, I'm not trying to forecast the absolute dollar profit from a loan. What I want to know is which are the expense items that change when I look across products or across segments. So I'm looking for a relative margin. Um, we can always add a fixed constant at the end to, to scale this up to make sure we're estimating uh, the uh, pricing we need correctly. But an example of this would be dealer fees. Of course, that is a big distinction between direct and indirect. In advanced models, sometimes people look at differences in customer service or collection expenses between segments. It's really whatever you want to focus on. Expenses are not usually where people start. We usually start with attrition and losses. So we make sure we get the revenue and loss items right. And then we can refine it with things like expenses. And in fact, I think I meant to mention uh, recoveries on this slide as well. Obviously, recoveries matter. We want to take into account the life of the vehicle. Uh, uh, you know, how much is that car worth now if they're charging off in the fourth year versus the second year? It's another obvious thing. So how do we do all this? Well, we don't do it all the same way. Some things need better models than others. Um, there are a few things we know. You will see, and in fact, on my next slide, I'll, I'll tell you once again the models I don't like. It's a complicated problem because when we look at our history, it's not just about the economy. This is an actual time series of mortgage delinquency for the entire U.S. economy. This data came from the Mortgage Bankers Association. And sorry, my little bullet point giving them credit must have gotten hidden, but hidden behind my slide here, my, behind my graphic. But um, you see bumps and wiggles along this delinquency rate. This data cut out in 2006 because I was trying to make a point. I was trying to look at what caused variation prior to the recession that we went into. Of course, in that recession, this delinquency rate skyrocketed. But if you start looking, just compare this not to economics, compare it to origination volume, another industry-wide measure. Origination volume goes through cycles. We have lending cycles, we have credit risk cycles, and we have economic cycles. The reason lending is hard is that we have three cycles here coming together making it very difficult to understand what's happened in the past. And what you see when you look at this is that every time there's an origination boom, there's a drop in the delinquency rate. Well, why does booking more loans make your delinquency go down? It's because the delinquency rate is a portfolio blended measure. If you're looking at your portfolio and you have, in the last two years, booked many more loans than you had previously, your blended delinquency will go down. It does not mean that you've done a good job, unfortunately. It just means you booked a lot of new loans. And new loans, according to those life cycles, are always lower risk, you know, especially if you're looking at something that peaks out two or three years later. 
So in the case of mortgage where that peak loss may come in three years, you've got a nice window of time here where you can drive down the blended delinquency rate just by booking a large volume of loans. And yet after that, you can see in the year right to the after my little uh, red bubble here, the delinquency sh rate shoots up. Because as soon as you stop booking lots of loans, the loans you have mature, they go into the riskier part of the life cycle and your delinquencies go up. There are some famous examples of how this has caused collapses. In fact, I worked with uh, banks in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. I was talking to one of them and they said, we're not sure we need loss forecasting. Our loss rates, delinquency rates, are extremely low. And I said, well, how, how have you been booking? Oh, we've had phenomenal growth. We've had 40, 50 percent year-over-year growth for the last three or four years. We're doing brilliantly. And honestly, I was afraid for the man because that is exactly when you expect a failure because you can't see the problems. You can't see if you're booking riskier loans just by looking at a delinquency rate if you've been booking such high volumes because of this effect, this aging effect. In fact, there are smaller cases of that. And, and that story is, yes, in fact, just a year later, they had a banking collapse in, in UAE. Um, in the US, this happens on a regular basis. Uh, there was an auto lender formerly known as AmeriCredit, and they only give their name because they told this story. The new management team told this story somewhat proudly at a conference about the old management team, which tells you a lot right there. Uh, but the old management team had been growing originations 30% year over year for several years. Their portfolio was growing like mad. They were a finance company. All their funding was coming from the market. The market thought they were doing a brilliant job and was giving them bargain basement uh, cost of funds for their originations. Well, the recession of 2001 came and the beginning of that caused the tiniest blip in their delinquency rates. And the investors, who honestly don't understand the dynamics of lending, panicked. They said, we thought you guys had this fixed. Why is your delinquency going up? So they didn't wait for further problems from the recession. They raised the cost of funds. They said, you're riskier than we thought you were. Well, in response to that, the finance company had to lower the volume of loans they were originating. And that was the beginning of the end. The moment they could not maintain exponential growth, their portfolio began to age. It went into the later parts of the life cycle. And ultimately, they collapsed as a lender. They had to be, uh, they sold off two-thirds of their portfolio. They were recapitalized and so forth. Um, understanding lost timing is everything. So you can see this has happened several times in the past. Um, this Latin, the one I'm showing here, the uh, volume growth in 1998-99 led to a drop in delinquency. That's the same time as this auto story I just gave. Most recently, in 2005, all the newspapers were had headlines that said record low delinquency, record high profits in mortgage, life is great. And that's when we knew life was about to end because, as we knew it, uh, because they were hiding all their problems under huge amounts of volume. So you can't price on this time series. That's why this is here. A delinquency rate, a historical delinquency rate, or a historical loss rate does not tell you how to price. And here's an example. What doesn't work for estimating future losses is just to do a moving average of the past. It doesn't work. A moving average is like a broken clock. You know, we know a broken clock is right twice a day. A moving average is right twice each economic cycle. It will be crossing, heading the wrong direction. Um, this is an actual accuracy study that was done where the yellow line is a moving average. It's got some annotation on it. The blue line was the actual 12-month forward losses. Uh, this was an ALLL calculation, uh, which, of course, is related to our pricing, our loss forecasting. So you can see the yellow curve is completely out of sync with the blue curve. That's why we built a better model. And the green curve is that better model, which in the period that it overlaps with actuals is tracking very nicely. It's in sync with the economy. The green curve is just doing a few things right. It's getting the life cycle right. It's integrating the credit risk that comes with the product features. 
and it's looking at the economic conditions. So this is not an insurmountable problem, but um, essentially moving averages, score to odds calibrations, and roll rates only work if the economy is flat, loan growth is flat, and underwriting is flat for multiple years. In other words, never. So what do we do? Um, here's the answer. The ingredients for success in any of these things is that you have to understand the life cycle of the product. You can get this through a certain amount of plotting. Just plot your vintages. A vintage is what loans did you book in first quarter of this year or January of this year or just 2014. It doesn't matter if you want to look monthly, quarterly, annually. But take a pool like that. Let's call it Q1 2014 track its performance over time separately from the rest of your portfolio. Make a graph that has that line compared to other vintages. How do they compare? The moment you line them up by the age of the loan, you'll see the life cycle. And that's what we're after. There are good quantitative ways to get it, but with everything, start with plots. Start with intuition. If I know that my peak losses are going to come two years out, then I can be a little bit more smart, a little bit more intuitive about if I just booked a lot of loans, I'll need to plan for losses in two years, and have I priced for the losses that I'm going to have in two years. So product features matter, borrower attributes matter, of course, economic trends matter. Um, different categories here. If you're looking at recoveries, Yes, it's great if you've got an auto portfolio to get the actual estimated recovery value for the autos, uh, the different vehicles. Uh, if you've got a line of credit, like a credit card portfolio, you're probably doing a moving average of recoveries, which is not, as I said, that's not a great model, but it, you're not highly sensitive to that. Um, it, you can track that. But things that really do matter sensitively, balances, attrition, loss forecasting, there's really only one category of models that has worked for these things through the last, through any recession we've looked at, and that's survival models or age period cohort models. These things are related, but basically, these work because they include exactly the three bullets we've got at the top of the slide. So life cycle, uh, vintage effects or or credit risk effects, and the economic effects. And as I mentioned, for recoveries, time series models, for expenses, many things you can do with time series models. So we're not saying that everything has to be phenomenal, but focus on a few important pieces. So I will say, I'm trying just to give you names. Really, this is an introduction so that you'll know what to look for. If, if you want to have somebody in-house or a vendor or a product, if you want to get a pricing model, Ask how they build a model. What's the pricing based on? So hopefully you can go back and say, do you consider the economy or the life cycle, etc. cetera? Uh, if anybody wants reading material, I've got reading material. <laughs> uh, I can just send us an email after the, the uh, webinar here, and we'll give you whatever reading material you like. When you put all this together, so I laid out all the different pieces, the components, the balances, the attrition, et cetera, and I laid out what you need to make models of those, the life cycle, the credit quality, the economic environment. When you put all that together, you're going to get a, a model for these things. So for each, this is what I just said, um, you go through and you build these models. You get the expected revenue through the life of the loan. You get the expected losses. We'll do this for a hypothetical loan within each product segment accumulate those for the full life, and make some intelligent decisions about the economy. Try some alternatives, see how sensitive our pricing is to a recession. And when we add that up, we get a margin calculation that we can lay side by side against the pricing matrix. Now the pricing matrix was an input here. We said, if we use market pricing, and we use all the things we know about the loans we would originate, What's our profitability? Well, I would say this graph was a surprise. Um, this graph showed that the profitability, after you've adjusted for losses and all the credit risk things, the profitability was still greatest in the highest risk segments, which means the market knows that those are higher risk segments and it is, in fact, overestimating the risk of those. 
given the current economic environment, for example, that may be why they're overestimating it. They're still looking backward to two, three years ago and pricing for the last recession instead of the current expansion. So there's a lot that goes into this, of course, but it's an interesting opportunity. So as you look across this, obviously we're not going to do everything in the highest risk group, but it gives us a, a view on where there are pockets of opportunity that we can test, we can start doing sampling of. So that's what we're after, not to do a complete switch, but to be able to make better judgment on how we want to adjust that pricing given these kinds of inputs. And so even if you don't have a model that connects everything I talked about into a final margin calculation like this, you still want to have those pieces, you still want to start integrating that in your judgment. So you can say judgmentally, how do I feel about the higher risk groups? Or how do I feel about the low margins on the best groups? So that's today's webinar. That's the message we wanted to convey. Um, feel free to contact us. Of course, we're here representing Deep Future Analytics. What we just described is part of our analytics suite. We're happy to talk to you about that. But the goal here was to inform, first and foremost. So hopefully we've had some questions. And uh, I'm going to open up the floor to uh, Dale to read out any interesting questions that have come. We do, Joe. Thank you. Um, we have three at this point. And I would also encourage any one of the participants who has a question, you, we can use the raised hand function. And uh, Austin or Lori will unmute your line, and you will be able to uh, ask your question directly of Joe. Uh, so the first one is, how much data does this take, and what do we do if we don't have it? That's always the best question. Um, the data needs here, let me put it this way, everything you just saw was done on a uh, portfolio. We didn't show you every step in the calculations, but we did this uh, example based on the in-house data at Denali Alaskan uh, Credit Union. Um, Dale, do you want to make a comment about uh, Denali's footprint? Our uh, total loan portfolio is just under well, I just hit 500 million a little while back, primarily auto, virtually all in Alaska. And it's been growing a good bit in the last three or four years. I think for the data, we went back nine years in total. But our problem was we didn't have enough um, real estate loan volume to really build good curves. Yeah, so we haven't done this for Denali's real estate portfolio in-house because and on that level, not enough data. For the auto portfolio, there was enough data. So this question of how much is enough is always a tough one. Uh, it's a matter of accuracy in the models. So right now, we're looking good in auto, where they've got a lot of concentration. Uh, if we had three or four years of data, that's going to show us the life cycle. It's going to, uh, if you get back to five or six years, you'll see the economic cycle to understand economic sensitivity. Um, of course, you can buy data from the credit bureaus uh, in order to use that to supplement what you're doing. One option for Denali Alaskan is to purchase either uh, loan 